Welcome to another episode of The Close-Up, a part of the Orlando Magic HQ Network. I'm your host, Stephen Cameron, and today we got a fun one. We got my friend Alex Kennedy of pretty much everything, writer at ESPN, the editor at NBA Alums, uh, Legends Magazine. He's got his his show, host of uh, Running Up the Score, um, and he's still very active, senior editor at Basketball News, uh, Alex Kennedy. What's going on, man? How you doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. I can't complain. Uh, had to pull out the magic hat uh, for the show here. Of course. Uh, things, uh, things have been good. I, I, I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing well. I can't complain. We are recording this Monday, February 19th, and I'm not working today. So, like, I, I'm really not complaining today, Alex. Um, you've you've been all over the place recently. You've you've we we've all been busy with All Star Weekend. You were at the Shaq Jersey retirement, which is also the Magic TNT game. We're gonna get into all that plus a whole lot more. Um, but before we get into all that, listeners, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, you know our HQ subscription program we have. We're actually doing a uh, listeners Q and A tomorrow night, Tuesday. Um, by the time you're listening to this, so if you want to participate in that. The subscription program is five dollars a month. It gets you into our group chat. It gets you into these, uh, you know, live roundtables that we do. It gets you twenty percent off home games, which that schedule that you you're getting up to twenty percent off home game tickets is released, and we have that available for anyone who wants to do it. Um, and then there's a bunch of other stuff that we do there. So check that out if you're interested in supporting the show on a bigger bigger deal. Um, and then we are also presented by Bet Online. Bet Online continues to be your number one source for all your basketball wagering needs, including pro and college hoops throughout the year. With up to up to the minute odds, stats, and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in-game live betting contests and all the best player props. Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime from your desktop or on your mobile devices. Head to Bet Online today to become part of the team, and remember to use promo code Believe B L E A V. That's Believe for your fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. And as that promo code stated, we are part of the Believe Podcast Network. Thank you, Believe. Alex, all right, we got all the we got all the ad reads and 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 the reminders to the audience done, and we can talk some basketball. You've been busy, man. Um, you, you've, we, we've had a busy, f- fun. Some might say fun. Some might say not fun. All Star Weekend. But, <laughs> but before we get into that, I, I do want to touch base. You were at a pretty cool, pretty cool event for the Magic. You know, you're at the TNT game, our first national televised game with TNT in a very, very long time. Um, which also led to the ja- the 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 Shaq jersey retirement. Um. I just want to pause there for a second before we get into uh, more current stuff. How was that experience for you? What was the atmosphere like at the game? What was the, you know, from your perspective, how was the Jersey retirement? And um, was there anything that like stuck out good and then anything that stuck out bad to you? What was that all about? Yeah, you know, I, I thought it was a ton of fun. Um, you know, I think it was a long time coming, obviously, for Shaq. And the Magic were kind of in a tough spot because they've had – a couple of stars now, superstars that have left on, you know, strange terms or, you know, ugly terms. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why Shaq was the first to have his jersey retired, because you could argue, you know, Tracy McGrady, uh, Dwight Howard. There's other guys that, you know, I mean, obviously Shaq called out a number of them too, Penny, Nick Anderson. There's plenty of guys that, you know, you can look at other teams and, and they probably would have had their numbers retired in other organizations. But the Magic have really not really done that. Uh, and I'm glad that they're starting to retire jerseys. And I thought it was really cool. You know, Shaq said that of the different jersey retirements, because this is his third jersey retirement now. Um, and he said this is the one that meant the most to him because he never thought it would happen because of how the relationship ended. Uh, you know, it seemed like it was a really special night for him. And I think Shaq is a, a class act. I think the fact that he used his speech to kind of shine light on his teammates and the other great magic players throughout franchise history that also deserve to be honored. I thought that was really cool. And we've seen like the magic have brought Tracy McGrady 
Rashard Lewis, Hito Turkoglu, uh, Nick Anderson. There's all these guys that they brought out and they've, they've honored them, you know, at halftime and, and things like that. Um, they've done that in recent years, but to actually have his jersey retired, I, I know that meant a lot to Shaq. And I'm excited to see who gets their jersey retired next. I'd imagine uh, Tracy McGrady has to be high on that list. Uh, you know, he's obviously, even though things didn't end perfectly, I, I think if you talk to most Magic fans, they still love Tracy McGrady. And a lot, you know, he's, for me, he's the player that really got me into basketball. Like he was my favorite player growing up. And so that's sure. uh, a huge one for me. And I would, I would love to, to go to his jersey retirement someday, uh, hopefully soon. Um, Dwight, it's tough because that not only ended on bad terms, but, you know, he's also, uh, you know, been in the media for some some bad things in, lately. And I'm not sure uh, we'll see that happen anytime soon. But uh, he's still, you know, I mean, Shaq he's still also, playing professionally, too. You know, like, yeah, he hasn't even retired he yet. Just, he just worked out for the Warriors last offseason. He's 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 still, yeah. you know, would probably welcome a chance back in the NBA. I, I think it's just too soon to even and bring up Dwight as far as, you know, potential. Like, like that's another five years down the road, 10 years, in my opinion. Yeah, Nick Anderson, he's been the most involved of everyone in the organization. You know, he's at every home game. He's yeah. been like a community ambassador, things like that. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if someday, you know, his jersey's retired as well. But yeah, it was a really cool event. I, I thought it was a ton of fun. I know some Magic fans were upset about like the the text or like the font on the actual jersey number. It's pretty bad. And it's pretty bad but um, and I thought it would have been cool to have each jersey like from the different eras you know i know i think that would look cool to have the different magic right. jerseys, like whichever jersey the guy played in uh have that be the jersey but no that, it was a, it was a how, really cool fun event that's how most teams do it like if you look at the lakers if you look at the celtics you look at the spurs i was just in sacramento a few months ago for like, the kings game it's like they all have unique feels to them none of them have this consistent font so it's like it's kind of strange that that's how they want to go about doing it but you know hey i don't make those decisions they get those people get paid probably a lot more than i do to uh to make those calls so we'll see how that turns out but um you know we'll see we'll see i thought it looked pretty cool i'm glad they waited to do the uh, the ceremony at the end because it was a very long lengthy one and allowed them to to kind of like just not interrupt the flow of basketball um which yeah. granted that was a rough game for the magic anyways but it, it wasn't was. exactly uh, a great basketball game versus the the Oklahoma City Thunder. But, um, you know, I still think, like, even though it's hard for the fans, I have to stay there even longer. And, you know, some of the momentum of the night might be gone because it's the end of the game. still think holding it at the end of the game versus having it at the beginning or even the middle is the right call because um, it could just, like, totally flow off players' flows and stuff like that. But it's cool to see the Shaq, cool to see the Shaq jersey. I have some thoughts on it that like, I don't, you know, it's fine if they're going to retire a Jersey and they, they want to change their, their standards on what gets a Jersey retired. I think it's fine to have shacks there, but I could also bring up a couple arguments onto why I don't think he, or even Tracy should have their, their Jersey retired, you know? Um, but, but you know, it's cool. We're here. It's up. He's a magic, magic legend, whether his Jersey is going to be retired or not. And uh, ultimately he did a lot of really cool things for the franchise and I really liked it. So we'll see, man. I think, I think we wait a few more years until they, they retire another Jersey. Like, I don't think this is going to be a thing that they do every year to, to catch up all of a sudden. I think it's probably going to be timed out a little bit. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I could see that, you know, after waiting so long with Shaq, uh, I could see them waiting a couple years. And um, I see your point, you know, neither guy brought a championship to Orlando. Um, Four years. But I think, yeah, they, yeah, didn't play there very long. So I can I can see the argument. Um, I guess uh, for me, I, I think, you know, if you can give a guy's flowers and uh, celebrate, you know, their stint here, I guess I don't look at it as like it should be something that's very – uh rare and uh obviously you don't want to give it out to everyone but like you know it's it's been three decades now of magic basketball i think honoring the best players and, and again if it's the best handful of guys you know two three four guys i think that's something that makes sense and and there's plenty of guys around the league that have gotten their jersey retired for much less i would argue too you know he was he did kind of help orlando become super popular and um took him to the finals and and had a great stint when he was there obviously everyone would have hoped it ended on better terms um i, I like the comment Shaq made too about trying to buy the team someday at the very end like hey give me a call <laughs> uh i know that's what something yeah. he wanted to do for a while there um but yeah you know i think again when you talk to magic fans people like Shaq, Tracy McGrady, you know, they brought a ton of fans to the organization. 
again, I just mentioned, I fell in love with basketball because of T Mac. So I don't know. I don't have a problem with it, but I do agree. They shouldn't just completely, you know, start handing them out left and right. It should be yeah. something that is saved for the best players in franchise history. I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I just like, I mean, if you're going to do it and you're going to change your standards for that, that's fine. Um, but I'm like, I also feel like, isn't that sort of what the, the hall of fame was like the magic hall of fame that we have. And you know, that's, that's how we honored them. And then the, 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 you know, they're, cause their whole thing for years is why we didn't retire jerseys. Cause you haven't, brought a championship to this this team yet and right that's why they had more the rarefied hall of, that's why they had the hall of fame and so it's just kind of weird and then when you look at you know the fact that it's like only four years but at the same point like it's not that serious he did some cool things for the franchise put us on the map um you know still you can kind of say he still loves the franchise there's definitely things that he said in past that that makes you question if that's actually true or not but but ultimately he's done a lot more good for the magic franchise than bad and 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 uh, it is cool to see his jersey up there retired. I'm definitely going to be smiling and looking at it next time I'm in the uh, the Kia Center, which will be pretty sweet. Um, Alex, now, since then, that was one of the last games we played, the Magic played. They played the, the Thunder, jersey retirement, and the very next night, they, they beat the Knicks, which was a really good game, almost, in my opinion, more important than the Thunder game, um, because that one actually is a first a uh, somewhat directly in front of you in the standings. You know, there's you know the the the, the Nets are the Knicks are just a few spots away from them um, in the playoff standings, and any any win in your own conference is a good win to keep you pushing, in my opinion. So, but 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 then before but but after that we got into the All Star. Paulo Bencaro made an All Star in his second year which is pretty incredible. The 21 year old was the youngest all-star um, on any of the teams. Um, you know, he was voted in by the coaches, not an injury replacement. What are your thoughts around just like in general, seeing Paulo wearing an all-star uniform. That's not just in the rookie sophomore game. I was really happy for him. I interviewed Paulo before the season on my show, writing up the score. And I asked him, you know, what his goals for the season were. And the two things that he said that were like accolades were, you know, all star and all NBA. Um, and he said, you know, I just want to take the next step and really make a big leap this season. And I know how much making the all star team meant to him. And to do it at such a young age, I mean, that was really impressive. Uh, and I think anytime you can kind of get your star player at, the all-star game we're playing with team usa where you're around a bunch of star players you know it, it can only really help uh from a confidence standpoint from you know with team usa i think it, it helps uh in terms of coaching and learning from other players and things like that and also you know one thing that we've we've heard a lot over the years from like a recruiting standpoint there have been plenty of stories where guys start talking during all-star weekend or team usa stints and kind of get close and then Whenever they make that call during free agency or before a trade deadline or things like that, um, they already have a, a relationship, an existing relationship that you can kind of build upon uh, or pick up a conversation where it previously left off. So I think it's great. I, I know he had a lot of fun with it. I have my issues with the All-Star game. I'm sure we'll get to that in a second. But for Paolo, I'm glad that he got a chance to experience that. You know, I saw after the game, he, you know, got his shoe signed by the whole team. And, like, you could tell it meant a lot to him. So, um and I can't say that for a lot of the guys that were there, clearly. Uh, so I thought it was really cool that he got honored. And, um, you know, hopefully the first of many, many, many all-star appearances for for Paolo. Yeah, I, you know, I, I feel very similar. Like, we, we'll get into the the events themselves here shortly. But I just think, like, how cool is it to for him to be around all these great players all at the same time after, you know, kind of being around some of them um, and some newer face, you know, some different faces, but, but a lot of familiar ones like Holly and stuff like that uh, and team USA. And it's just like being around guys that are the best at their, their, their craft and the best in the league, um, you know, and, and being able to, you know, potentially pull, you know, Giannis to the side and be like, Hey man, can I ask you a couple of questions and like have a five minute conversation about certain things? Like, I mean, I don't know if that's what he's doing, but the, having the ability to do that if he wanted to, and I'm sure he has in some aspect, but just building those relationships, building those, those, you know, connections, like, you know, we know he's got a relationship with Kevin Durant has worked out with him over the summer, but like, Hey, maybe this summer because of all-star, he might go work out with Giannis for a little bit, you know, or, or something like that. You just don't know what this could be leading up to. And I just think that's like super fun and really cool and just really nice way for him to continue to get integrated with like the best of the best in the league, which is really fun. 
he does strike me as a type that would take advantage of the opportunity. Like I mm-hmm. interviewed him a while back, uh, and, and he and Jason Tatum got close whenever he committed to Duke, and he and Tatum would talk all the time and would text, and like they became really close to the point that Tatum helped him find an agent, get a shoe sponsorship. Like yeah. he 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 said that Tatum was the guy that was helping him more than anyone throughout the pre-draft process when it came time to kind of you know do those things, and then even uh right before his rookie season tatum's giving advice about playing his first game and things like that so you know he did he's done that with tatum you mentioned the kd connection i feel like he's someone and he's talked about how like when he gets a chance to match up against those big superstar players uh it's still kind of surreal for him and and you know he loves that because he went from playing as these guys on nba 2k a few years ago to now you know being the number one option facing off against them as you know uh peers and to now be peers in a different way at an all-star game i I do think he's the type that would pull these guys aside and ask for advice or make plans to work out or or things like that um which is what you want to see i think you know a lot of times nowadays players will say oh i'm not i don't recruit or they don't really want that uh out there because i think some of them think it's like a slight to their current teammates if they're going out and talking to other star players and recruiting guys but paolo seems the type that i think he would be okay with that and basically just put himself out there and be like not only just from a recruiting standpoint but also again getting advice and making the most of those opportunities and relationships yeah you know he's a very thoughtful person um you know he puts a lot of um just energy into how he approaches relationships and conversations and um you know doesn't just say the first thing that comes out of his mouth i i, I think that that it's going to allow him to just continue just like grow and network within this organization and in this league and just, just build, build relationships for the future. You know, like some of these guys are going to be requesting trades and becoming free agents in the next couple of years. And maybe there's ways that Paulo is making relationships today that might, might cause someone to be a little bit more interested in Orlando. And that's, that's ultimately an awesome thing. Um, and yeah, man, like, Gosh, we should see Paula what make what's your guess? Maybe maybe 10, 12 All-Stars in in his career as long as he stays healthy. I mean, he's he just made his first one at 21 in his second year. If he plays, you know, 18 years and, you know, he hasn't even reached his peak yet and it, I I feel like 10 should be pretty obtainable for him at least. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think I, I think Paolo, when you look at his ceiling, if he realizes his full potential, you're talking about a guy that makes 10 plus all star games talking yeah. about a guy that could be like a top five, top 10 player in the NBA. He's that good. And he's that mature, too. I mean, obviously, we see his game and just how how great of a player he is. But uh, physically and like emotionally, like you talk to the guy and he does not seem like he just turned 21 years old. You no, would think he's, you know, mature. you think he's like early thirties, late twenties. Like he's very, very mature for his age. So yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of factors that go into that injuries, things like that. Uh, but if all goes right for him, he could be a 10 to 15 time all-star for sure, which is what you want. If, I mean, yeah, that, that's the dream for an NBA team, especially, Absolutely. I mean, seeing him do it at 21, it's just, it's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, and you know, it's fun, man. Like, and like we said, he's 21. He just played in the rookie sophomore game. Did you get a chance to watch that? I actually didn't watch the rookie sophomore game. Um, I just had other things going on that day, and I didn't feel like going back and rewatching it to be fully transparent. I did not. I'll be completely honest with you, and this cool. is part of my issue with All-Star Weekend. I did not watch the rookie sophomore game. I watched some highlights afterwards and, you know, saw what happened and edited yeah. an article about it and stuff. So I know what happened. You know, Benedict Matherin went MVP. I know there was the upset with the G-Leaguers and all that. Like, I, I saw what happened afterwards. But I'll be honest, I watched very little of the actual All-Star game. I turned it off because I was just – it was horrible. I, and I'll – in recent years, that's been happening more and more frequently. Like when I was younger, I would look forward to the all-star game and, sure. you know, T-Mac throwing the ball off the backboard and, you know, the, it was cool back in the day. Now I just feel like I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go enjoy the night out or, or go out to eat or something. Like I look at it as like, okay, this is one day I don't have to watch basketball. So I turned it on for a second. Totally. I turned it off. So, you know, I, again, I know what happened, but I did not watch much of the actual all-star game. And I know the issues with it. I mean, I, I think, there's a lot wrong with the all-star game. I don't know how the NBA can fix it. Like to me, all-star Saturday night has always been kind of the peak of all-star weekend. Like, especially when the dunk contest was great. Did you watch Saturday? I did watch Saturday and I really enjoyed it. I actually Uh, thought Saturday was really good too. I loved it until the dunk contest. That was obviously rough, but like the three point contest was great. I really enjoyed the skills challenge. I thought the Steph versus Sabrina matchup was really cool. That was fun. I think there's more things the NBA can do. I, I tweeted this out on Saturday night, but I would love to see them 
incorporate some like recently retired players too and have like a three point shootout or like even like a modified shootout where maybe they each shoot fewer shots or you know they don't have to run around as much or something but it would be like I, I think if they had a three point shootout and you had Ray Allen, JJ Redick, Peja Stoyakovich, Kyle Korver, Richard Lewis, like you had some of the best shooters of all time. Uh, Reggie Miller, I know mentioned during the broadcast that he, if he had a month, he could still go out there and shoot well. Like you don't lose your shot typically when you're uh, a former NBA player. Like you, you I've, I've been at games and seen, you know, some of these assistant coaches that are in their forties and fifties and they're just knocking down shot after shot. I think it'd be cool to have something like that. Obviously there's a lot of talk about like a one-on-one -on -one matchup or one-on-one -on -one tournament. That would be really cool to see. They tried horse and that was kind of a bust, but I don't know. I think the NBA has to do something because the all-star game, I see more criticism now than ever before. It seems like it's gotten really bad and, and people just aren't tuning in. They kind of know what to expect at this point. Um, all-star Saturday night, I think is still really good, but I think the dunk contest is a problem. <laughs> really? And I actually like this year's dunk contest. I mean, like I thought it was there was some like, there was some questionable stuff with like, some of the judging, but like ultimately, a lot of guys made their dunks on their first try. There was that's only true. a couple that didn't, which that's that's what you want, right? Hands down, just make your dunks, and and they all did them. I thought there was some creativity in the dunks. Uh, obviously, Mac had some good creativity with his dunks. Um, you know, I I was Jalen Brown's dunks the best in the world? No. And did they push him a little bit harder than others? No, or yes, they did, but like, yeah, yeah, ultimately, I don't really have a problem with that at all, just because, like, Jalen Brown's one of the first bigger names we've had in the dunk contest in years, in years, probably since the Zach Levine era and and uh, Aaron Gordon era. And he's definitely a much bigger name than those guys were at their time when they entered. And it's like, if they can give that guy a little bit of extra cushion just to maybe motivate some other names to join in the future, that'd be great. Now, did it was a little bit of a letdown that his dunks kind of didn't hit very hard. Yeah, I can, I can admit that, but I think overall I liked seeing the dunks. I wish there was some bigger names, but you ain't going to get bigger names. If it's not, if, 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 if you don't have at least a baseline. And I thought this was like, it didn't get worse than last year's. Um, I don't know. I just think I have, a little, maybe some different expectations because like, I just realized like most all-stars from the time I've been watching all-stars have sucked outside yeah. of a couple outlier years. Like we've been talking about this dunk contest being amazing for so long. And it's all like, and pretending like it's only been bad for like the last decade. Well, it's been bad for, decades upon decades and then we've have a couple outlier the outliers years. yeah You're and right. that's the that's same fair. with the nba game too with the with this all-star game it's been horrible for 30 years and it's been good a couple of outlier years like we had the chicago you know, r.i.p the you know the kobe year when he passed away and everyone tried hard that year the the chicago year the vince carter dunk contest zach levine dunk contest like I just think we as fans and as media, like we put it up on this pedestal that it's really never actually been in outside of a couple outlier years. Am I wrong here, Alex? Yeah. Well, and you're right. The Chicago year, and the Kobe year were the same year too. So, I mean, that's even, yeah, yeah I, I think um, it's interesting because the players don't care. So if you're a fan, you're like, Hey, well, why should we care? Uh, that's what it comes down to. And we spend so much time talking about all-star births and snubs and all this. And then like the game itself is just such a letdown. So I think it could be something really cool. Like could, I was at absolutely that, could be better. I was at that all-star game in Chicago. And I think there were a number of factors that led to it being arguably the best all-star game ever. Not only the Kobe factor that, and they honored him. You had Pau Gasol, you know, speak to everyone. And, and it was, that was something that was significant, but also you had uh, – it was the first year they did, like, the, the Elam ending and the quarters and everything like that. Yeah. And I think the – I don't necessarily think that is something that I would bring back. But the one thing that I thought really stood out to me being there live was they had, like, the recipients of each charity sitting courtside, like, in sections. And so, you – like, whenever uh, a stop would happen or a quarter was won or a big shot happened, you had, like, kids from the Boys and Girls Club going nuts – and the players were going yeah. over and like interacting with them between uh, breaks and timeouts and dapping them up. And, you know, some of the kids were like crying and stuff like it was you could tell the guys were like, OK, I need to go win for these guys right now. And they saw the direct person that was benefiting from their effort 
you know, sitting courtside. And I thought that was something that was really cool. And then sure enough, end of the game, you had like, it felt like a playoff game at times uh, when guys were matching up and the defense was really intense. And, um, and then again, you got the fans that, uh, you know, the boys and girls club, I forget the other charities that were there, but they were like going nuts and players went and celebrated with them afterwards and stuff. And like, that was really cool. So I don't know what they can do to bring that back. I, I, I didn't go to this year's all-star game. So I don't know if they, had the the charity component and had the guys sitting courtside like if they brought the recipients of the uh you know donations and, and had them kind of rooting the teams on because i think that definitely had an impact uh obviously uh in, in recent years like covid Im- impacted things so uh i don't know if i think that would be something i would try to bring back like let the players see who they're playing for and have them cheer them on because it's hard to be like yeah i'm only gonna shoot left-handed and not really try <laughs> and not play hard when like the kids right there yeah. and that could be benefiting from your efforts so i don't know i think that was when they did that was cool that year um you're right about the dunk contest too it's always when it's a a really awesome contest it is more of an outlier there have been quite a few that were you know, not great. I think with this one, Jalen Brown really struggled. And I give him a ton of credit because we have not seen, you know, all-star level players competing in the dunk contest. Yeah. So he, I, I get why he wanted to do it. And, the, you know. The judges are just the biggest failure of the The dunk judges contest. are the worst it's, part it's, of it. It's not the participants. Like, okay. Yeah, you're right. They, they, they pushed, they had an agenda to, to push Jalen Brown through to the final round, which I can, as much as it sucks as a viewer, I can understand why they did it. You just wish it was a little bit more competitive and not so biased as that's what they were doing. Right. Yeah. But, but like the judges are just kind of, they're inconsistent. They're, they're, they're not good. And they just get these old grumpy dudes. Like get these, I'm sorry. And I, I, and Alex, you write for the, for the old, for the, for the alumni, get most of them out of the judging. These 19, 20 year old kids don't know who Oscar Roberts is and they probably don't give a shit. Like, just to be honest, like he doesn't matter. Get him out. Get half these guys out. Get the glove out. Like, let's get some fresh faces up there. Some guys that have like relatively been in the league that are like currently there and and maybe mix in an older guy or two. It doesn't have to be like all young versus all old. It, It could be a blend, but let's get some fresh faces up there. Um, you know, Let's simplify the judging a little bit. Like, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, I don't want it to be simplified as like, Hey, you just get a number one through 10 and you can like do that. Cause like, we've kind of done that in the past, but like, it just seems like, you know, like there was the, you shouldn't be knocking them for missing it on their first try, but then they do it anyways. Like right. some of that stuff should just be kind of flushed out a little bit. Um, but ultimately I thought, you know, was the dunk contest perfect? No, but I thought it was fun. All-star game though, man, I feel like you're right. Like there can be a lot of things done differently. I have some thoughts. Like one is simply like, go ask Giannis, LeBron, Dame, Harden, like go ask all these guys that are in the dunk or that are in the all-star game every year and say, Hey, the product isn't good. How can we make it better? Right? Like it's, it's no one's enjoying it at this current point in time like some things have changed to allow it like we've we've uh i don't think defense has ever really been played all that consistently again outside of a couple years but like the game has shifted it's it's now people just want to launch threes from all over the place so people are just kind of like stepping in half court and letting it fly and that's where we see less of the off the backboard dunks and the ollie oops and things like that we just we don't get that same connectivity because they just they just step across half court and then then shoot a three. Um, you know, I, I think there's just simply like, okay, players, how do we make this better? That still maybe isn't a full on basketball game, but like it puts a better product on the floor. Um, I also think you could shorten the game a little bit too. Do we really need to be playing full quarters? No, probably not. We could probably get away with like 10 minute quarters, just shorten it up a little bit. Um, I think having a shorter product would, would make, would make, um, you know, probably put a little bit more emphasis on the players. And then I also just think we as fans just need to accept that that is, is a different product and it's not going to be this highly competitive game. It's never going to be that way. So like, I think there's just a couple of things and we have to like kind of treat it that way. And then also the third is we got to fix the broadcasting. Like that was my next point. They sucked the whole, the whole weekend. They were awful. Like how do you have that awesome moment with Steph and Sabrina? And then you have, 
I think it was like Chuck and someone else going back and forth. It about, was Kenny Smith. And yeah, Reggie it was Miller. Kenny Smith. Yeah, Reggie sorry, Miller Reggie. to his to, like, to Reggie's credit, he was mocking Kenny and was basically saying like he was standing up for Sabrina, and then he yeah, was like, but, "What? You want to play with dolls too?" So he was trying to get Kenny, but when you clip it, it came off pretty poorly for both it's of them. Pretty bad, yeah. And then Here's you my, know yeah. the announcing I, in the the All Star game was like pretty bad too. Like celebrate these players, talk about their that's, their awards, their accomplishments, their teams. Don't just you know, like, we don't need to talk about what's actually on the court. Let's talk about the players on the court, you know, and, and not shitting on the city and making jokes. Like, it's not a time for jokes. Let's, let's be serious here. That was my next point. I think, if anything, the main things that need to come out this weekend, if you're the NBA league office and you're kind of talking about, okay, how can you improve the product? I agree. I mean, I agree with you, everything you said about, you know, the, the actual all-star competition. But I think... I, if I'm Adam Silver, I'm not only upset. You saw him after the game. He was not pleased with that all star game. Um, but if I'm Adam Silver, I'm like, I don't want, you know, millions of fans turning on our product, whether it's Saturday night or Sunday night, and just getting bombarded with so much negativity. I cannot tell you how last time I turned on like an NFL broadcast and you had current or broadcasters, former players that were just like actively shitting on the product and being super yeah. negative. So when bad. you watch the NFL product, they're celebrating today's players. They seem excited about the game. They're passionate and they're about it. They're playing flag football. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm, not even talking, I'm not even talking about like pro bowl. I'm talking about just like any broadcast. Like yeah. you put on an NFL broadcast and they're sharing analytics and they're, they're teaching you about the X's and O's and the strategy and the decision making and celebrating today's players. And here's what makes Patrick Mahomes so great. And da, 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 da. And sometimes they maybe even go overboard with some of the, you know, praise for current players. Like I know some people like Tony Romo and Chris Collinsworth, they've gotten criticized for being like overly, uh, high on like Patrick Mahomes and some players, but I much prefer that to just tearing down players and negativity and uh, just talking about things that aren't even related to to basketball. Uh, I don't know. And I I think like Kenny Smith on Saturday night had a really, really rough night. You mentioned the Sabrina Steph moment. There were some other ones too, where it it just felt like he even said, I, you know, I didn't know Tyrese Halliburton could shoot this well. And Reggie Miller's like, do you guys not watch the games? Like, what are you watching? Um, how are you he, preparing for this all-star weekend? Right. And so, and I think that's a big problem when you watch, you know, inside the NBA or, uh, even like at current broadcasts, like it never is talk about the actual game. It ends up being, you know, narrative driven stuff or random stuff. And I don't know. It's, it, I think if you're the NBA, you want people tuning in to become big NBA fans and learn about the game and the players on the court. And, um, you know, these are current players that could be sharing stories from their own career or analyzing the game really well or things like that. Instead, we're seeing them uh, be really critical. And and some of that, I knew Shaq's even mentioned, like some of that is pettiness and jealousy over like the big contracts that guys are getting today or frustration with how today's game is uh, in terms of how it's played and, and things like that. But I don't know. I, I think, Again, this should be like a weekend celebrating the best players and, and stuff like that. And it seems like there's a ton of negativity. So the broadcast definitely, I think, hurt things. Um, and not even just yesterday, but I'm talking like Saturday too. Yeah, um, well, it's not great. So yeah, I don't the, know. I think the broadcast is the is the biggest failure of of the weekend, even bigger than yeah. the game, in my opinion. That and it was the that, same cause, thing cause last it, year. Yeah. Last year, Draymond Green was literally like just making fun of the dunkers during the dunk contest <laughs> and talking about how they're scrubs and stuff. Like, how is that helping the NBA product? If you're if you're like in the league office watching that, I'd be yeah. like, "What are you doing? You trying to turn TV off? Like, what you, what's going on here? I don't know." Right. It's it's really and, and unfortunately, like the NBA, you know, it's TNT that's broadcasting the 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 weekend. So like, they only have so much control over what what can be done, you know, to an extent too. So it's just like, yeah, but it's like fix fix the broadcast. You know that that will help when players know they're not getting it shit on the whole time like that. That'll make them want to play a, l- a little bit harder um, or at least maybe be a little less scared to try to be a little bit more aggressive. And, and now stuff. it's just like I, it's not fun. I will say I do think I do think the players deserve criticism for the effort on Sunday. I know there was a report sure. today from Sam Amick of The Athletic basically came out and said players want to get paid. And then they'll try. And it's like, you know, you're getting getting paid every every single player in that game is getting a ton of money. Not only are your is your NBA contract huge, you have a ton of endorsements. A lot of these guys have clauses in their contract where if they if they earn an all star 
selection, then they get a huge bonus and stuff. So it's like, I, I, I think that is crazy. If you're like, we're not going to play yeah, harder I until agree. you pay us. Like that's, that's BS. And so that bothered me. And then the players, I mean, they could try a little bit harder again. No one's expecting you to, you know, defend like it's game seven of the NBA finals, but give a little bit of effort and try. I also think, you know, it sucks that we don't see more star players compete in the dunk contest. Again, I give Jalen Brown credit. Um, after seeing how people have reacted to Jalen Brown, I can't imagine other stars are going to want to step up and, and do the same thing. I actually talked to um, an NBA star two, three years ago, and I asked him, you know, why do we think, why do you think more all stars don't compete? And he was like, it's a lose lose situation for us. Like, if we, if we win the contest against fringe NBA players and now G League players, like, it's, it's, we did what we were supposed to do. It's expected. If we lose, then we're getting clowned. We're getting made fun of, and it doesn't, it doesn't help us at all. So they basically said to lose, lose. And, and the guy's solution was you need to get a field where it's, you know, three to four all-star level players. And then it's a little bit different. Like if you look back when Dr. J competed, you know, in the ABA contest in 76, all those guys were multi-time all-stars, George Gervin, Artis Gilmore. Uh, there was yeah. a number of guys, you know, it, it, and when Michael Jordan competed, it was against Dominique Wilkins and, you know, notable players. Like, um, it's different if it was like, hey, Michael, go compete against, you know, like minor league level players or fringe NBA guys. Like, I, I could see what LeBron being like, no, I don't want to go dunk against whoever, like a guy that's not going to be in the NBA. Um, so I don't know. I think they need to find a way to incentivize players to compete and get multiple all-stars. Now, you would think this year with Jalen Brown signing on, maybe some other all-stars would be like, okay, there's already one. The first one's going to be the hardest one to get. So you would think maybe some other guys would be like, oh, they got an all-star. Maybe I'll do it too. But I don't know. I, I think uh, if you want a bigger names, it's going to be tough. I know they talked about like a big prize and stuff like that. I don't know. Part of me, it, just, it bothers me that so much of it's like money-driven. It seems like unless the money's there, they're not going to compete, and that's tough. I think – like it doesn't even necessarily have to be all stars. Like it could just be like let's just get some good notable NBA players. players to do this. Notable right. players, yeah. someone that like a, a name people actually recognize the name, not um whatever his name Toppin is. You know, yeah, I Jacob don't know Toppin. His name. To Jacob your point, Toppin. Zach Levine and like, Aaron Gordon weren't all stars, but they were notable players that were like you, you, key you at franchise least knew who they were types. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You knew who they were. You know, Aaron Gordon was pretty young, but like, no, oh, Aaron Gordon. You probably know he's the guy on the Magic uniform that plays every single game and does insane dunks inside the games, right? Like when you turn on that game, like you see his highlights regularly, even though we would get destroyed, um, you know, when he was on our teams, like, you know, same yeah. with Zach Levine, like you, like they, they were at least relatively known players, right? You know, they're, they were young at the time. I was looking at, you know, some old videos. And it's like, man, Aaron Gordon, like he Baby barely face. learned how to shave at that point in time, you know, it was pretty <laughs> fun, but you know, all-star weekend is, it is what it is. It's going to be like this probably for a long time. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's kind of fine. Like, I think you made yes, a good point too. Like should... adjust your expectations. That's really what it comes down to. Adjust your expectations. If you're not expecting yeah. it to be the best dunk contest ever or guys competing like crazy. And you're just like, Oh, it's a fun game where, you know, maybe we see Damon Lillard shoot from half court and we see, you know, so Some it's like crazy okay, maybe... athletics in the dunks. Like, dude, right. We saw a dude jump over Shaq. And he cleared him and he wasn't bending his head, you know, like he literally cleared the top of Shaq's fucking head and dunked the ball. And that was gnarly. Like, like, let's just celebrate this stuff, you know? Okay. Some of Jalen Brown's dunks weren't the craziest, but he also did some cool things too. You know, it's like, I don't know. I think there's part of, there's part of the issue too is we need to have. Yeah. Part of it's social media too. So yeah. you go online you're like, wow, everyone's hating this. And you yeah. see ev like, you know, back in the nineties or early two thousands, even, you know, if you were like, oh, this dunk contest wasn't great. You don't immediately get bombarded with thousands right. of people talking about how it's the worst one ever and it's garbage. So like, there's right. kind of like a mob mentality aspect of it too, where it's like, man, this was awful. Everyone hates it. Like I, I think the, now just everyone has a platform to speak out about how annoyed they were by certain things or oh, yeah. things like that. So that's probably part of it too. It seems have, like it's the worst ever because of that. Because yeah, it always will seem like it's the worst ever. When it's really it's I mean, it's not great. I'm not saying it is, but it's it's not not I mean it it's if we could just like it's like walking into a theme park. You know you're gonna wait in the long lines and you you but but you know when you get on the ride it, it could be fun, but also if you hold the line to the ride, then you're just going to, eh, you know, like you can make a theme park day really fun if, or you can make it really bad. And it could be the same day, no matter what, it's just your mindset going into it. I don't know. I, it's got issues. It can be improved. It should be improved, but also like, it's kind of, it's always been shitty. I don't know. That's kind of like where I'm leaving it right now, but 
but, and at least it's not the NFL where you have you know every single player opting out of the All Star game or Pro right. Bowl, where you're down to Tyler Huntley making the Pro Bowl because no other quarterbacks want to do it. So he can't even right. start his own team, but he's in the Pro Bowl. Like I, I give guys credit; at least they're at least showing up. And you know, LeBron's done it twenty totally. straight years. Like it could be worse. It's just I, I get fans wanting to improve it too. Totally, yeah. And it should they should want to improve it. You know, Adam Silver should be disappointed on how this weekend went. You know. Um, now onto something fun and positive. The magic are crushing it. Like they're 30 and 25. Um, they are, hold on. Let me just go to the standing page. I actually did not sitting in eighth place. I want to like grab the tears, but they, they have the easiest remaining schedule. They have some really cool things like within the schedule coming up. That's going to be fun. Um, but hold on before I just continue to ramble. I just want to take a moment to like, actually get my shit together as i go into the standings of the orlando magic and the nba um listeners just just give me your patience my computer is being wonky for a second um i know they're in eighth place people and i know there's some people ahead of them i just want to figure out who i can read them off to you right now if you want read to. them off to me please miami's in seven indiana's in six philly's in fifth New York's in fourth, Milwaukee third, Cleveland second, Boston first. Right. And the bubble teams right after them, uh, they're four games ahead of the ninth place team, but Chicago and Atlanta are 9-10. And this is where I – and thank you for reading that because that allowed me to pull up what I was trying to do and also just find some numbers that were going behind all that. The Magic are actually tied with Miami Heat at 30 and, 30 and 25 for the seventh and eighth. There are a game behind Indiana Pacers that are 31 and 25 – the fifth seed of the 76ers who do not have Joel Embiid for the foreseeable future only have 32 and 30, uh, 22 wins. And then the New York, New York Knicks who the magic just beat before all-star 33 and 22 sitting at fourth seed. So They're I just wanted spot. to like, I wanted to bring up like that specific page I was looking for um, so that we could see like how tight this race really is right now and how the next 27 games are so important for the Orlando Magic and how they finish this season. When you look at this team, where they're at today, and the remaining 27 games, what's the first thing that comes into your head on what has to happen? I think you have to win the winnable games. I mean, you talked about it earlier. They have the easiest schedule, not in the East, but in the NBA for in terms of remaining schedule. Uh, their, their remaining teams that they're facing have a combined winning percentage of uh, 43.5%. Um, I have a stat here. 16 of their 27 remaining games are against the 12 teams with a losing record. No other team has more than 13 games against the bottom 12 and they're 16 and five against those teams this season. So, I mean, they've, they've done it a good job of beating the winnable team, you know, winning the winnable game so far, but I think you just have to be happy that, you know, you have this very easy schedule the rest of the way and take advantage of that. You know, you, you just mentioned the, the standings are pretty tight together. So if they can go on a run and finish season strong, you're talking about this team potentially climbing up the standings up to, you know, six, five, like they could, they could really get up there. So I, I think that's the key. Um, so many of the team, I mean, this team is so good defensively and their effort and their length and size, it gives people issues. You know, there's other teams hate playing against the magic. The offense has been the biggest issue. Um, I saw a great stat in uh, NBA.com's power rankings. The Magic rank bottom 10 offensively, and this would be the 12th straight season that they'd be bottom 10 offensively. It's just Pretty been bad. year after year this team Sense has struggled. Dwight. Yeah, and and uh, it's it's been brutal. And like we all we all know the t- the team has struggled to shoot threes, and they don't even take a lot of threes compared to other teams. But they also here's another great stat. They have they rank number one in the NBA in free throw rate, so they're getting to the line often. All the they're twenty seventh in free throw percentage. So that again, you look at just you're you're drawing the contact and getting the freebies, and then you're just not taking advantage from the line at all. And so that's that's frustrating. And again, part of that's being a young team. Part of that's roster construction. They don't have a, a, a lot of shooters, uh, and I think. We all, if we look at, you know, head to the off season and I know a lot of fans of the trade deadline too, were wanting, you know, shooters and guys that can help from that, in that regard, Tyus Jones name was thrown out there and people were excited about that possibility. That has to be the focus of this off season and trying to improve the team, you know, improve the shooting, improve the spacing. And then, uh, without really sacrificing the defense too much. Uh, so yeah, 
that's and, the that's and, the hard part. And and what we have right now is the fourth best defense in the league, and that's been their calling card on how they've been winning. Um, you know, thirty games so far, and have improved as a team, and and they're healthy, and they have key yeah. players like Jonathan Isaac playing like a much significant much bigger and more insignificant role, which is really helpful for them too right now. Like, have you seen the closing lineups where it's like Jalen Suggs, Franz, Paulo, Jonathan Isaac, and Wendell Carter? Like, they just get huge. And then I think what's been really cool is like, we're seeing coach make decisions. They're not always the right decisions, but he is trying to go a little bit more within flow and play within certain matchups where it's like, cool. Wendell Carter, you haven't been as effective as, as, as you normally are we're going to bring in Goga to close this game out tonight, yeah. you know, and Goga hadn't played, you know, for, for a long time, you know, the other night he closed with Cole Anthony on the floor. I don't know if that was the right decision or not, but he's trying different things to make certain situations happen, which is really nice to see his flexibility there. And you just hope it starts to pay off in the long run. I think there's a few things that we can do to secure, like, I mean, I expect this team to make the playoffs, but like, to to secure maybe avoiding the play in is like one we got to protect of pr- protect home we have an eight game homestand during this road trip or during the next 27 games um and granted it's not against like the easiest teams in the world but there's a couple of easy teams in there you got the raptors the hornets the pelicans tough team the kings tough team the warriors the clippers are tough teams but then you have the grizzlies and the blazers so you have some easy teams mixing with some tough teams you got to do really well during that homestand if you can. That's eight games in a row where the Magic just get to chill and and be comfortable in their house. And then you have um, another really cool thing about the remaining 27 games is you don't have any significantly long road trips. There's no road trip. There's like, I think, two or three road trips that are three games long and nothing is longer than that, which is really, really cool. Um, so you just got to you got to take care of that and you got to show up to every single game and you got to let your defense be what's leading the leading this change. If, if they get too trigger happy offensively, they're 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 I mean, you got to make shots, obviously, but you can't go into a game thinking you're going to beat the teams in front of you with offense and not defense, in my opinion. That's kind of like where I think we get where where the team gets messed up every now and then is they just get, they lose their defense. They focus too much on offense and then they just kind of crap themselves. Yeah, I agree with that. I I think uh, I agree with you on, on coach Mosley and his willingness to stick with the hot hands and kind of uh, sometimes it even carries over to the next game. Like we've seen him stick with a group that played well and start the next game together because it was working really well. I, I think that I like that. Um, there have definitely been times throughout the season where they've had just a ton of injuries and, you know, I can't really fault them for those stretches when, no, you know, they're, they're super limited. Hard. Um, so now the fact that they're healthy, I think there's a lot of exciting things you can take away from this season too. Like Jalen Suggs entering this season, he was kind of on the bubble where fans were like, I'm not sure if this guy's gonna really pan out. Is he part of the future core? Is he not? And he's been awesome. You know, I think that he's like the heart and soul of that defense. He's shooting almost 39% from three point range. Like his, he's yeah, really like shown... five or 6% uh, volume too. Five yeah. Or six it's attempts volume attempts. Yeah. He's it's awesome to see what he's become. Jonathan Isaac looks like obviously the minutes aren't there because he's, they're being very cautious with him, understandably. Uh, but when he's out there, he's making a huge impact. And he's one of those guys, like, there's a, obviously we talk a lot about defensive versatility and stuff, but I'm not sure there's anyone that can literally guard one through five the way he can and, and affect guys so much. So he's been fantastic, not shooting the ball well, but defensively it's been there. Um, there's a lot of positive takeaway. And then obviously, like, what we've seen from, you know, Paolo and Franz and just the step they forward they've taken, obviously. but. I'm curious, what do you think is going on with Cole Anthony and Markel Fultz too? Like I was looking at his stats, you know, he went from being a guy that was attempting like one and a half threes per game to now he's barely shooting again. He's shooting 14% from three on the season. And then it's not even just impacting his three point shots. He's shooting 56% from the free throw line, which is crazy. Like there were times in Orlando, he was shooting 89% from the free throw line. He just is really struggling. I don't know. I mean, obviously he's been injured and has uh, been in and out of the lineup and things like that, but is that a confidence issue? Confidence issue? Like what do you think is going on with Markel and, and then Cole who's been struggling quite a bit? Oh yeah. Good questions, man. Um, I, I think with Markel, I think it's a couple of things, right? Um, I'm going to just first state off. I, I like Markel Fultz as a player. I like him as a person. Um, he seems like a great teammate. Uh, I don't really have many negatives to say about him, you know, off the court. I think on the court, 
you know, he's got that nerve injury that is never going to go away. That is something he has to manage. And I think we're just seeing it being a factor in, in his body right now. Um, you know, I also think he had the knee, uh, the knee tendonitis that kept him out for, I, I forget however many games it was 20 something games. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not a shot, like, I'm not a basketball coach and I don't understand the human body all that well, but I'm pretty darn sure that if you're not feeling good in your lower body, it's probably going to affect your upper body on how you shoot the ball as well. So if he's not feeling great down in his knees and he's not feeling great in his shoulder, it's probably going to mess you up mentally too. And so when you put the physical with the mental, it just allows you not to be your best product on the floor. Um, and, and I don't, I don't care what anyone thinks. If you're not feeling good physically, it messes you with you mentally. Right. And so, um, you know, it, it is mental with him to an extent because I think it is also physical with him to an extent. Um, and, and then, you know, I think there's just, his role has changed, right? Yeah. The ball, even when he's on the court, the ball is not being run through him all the time. It is part of the time, but it's also being run a lot through Paulo and a lot through Franz. And then you're also seeing coach willingly like, Hey man, you kind of don't got it right now. So we're going to play someone else instead. And we're not going to close with you. And I think all of that is just a lot, Um, you know, particularly when you're dealing with, with also like trying to get your body right and stuff like that. And he doesn't have a contract coming up after this. He's not extended right now. So I think there's just, I think there's just a lot of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's okay. Um, I, I mean, I want him to play better. Absolutely. But I think like, I think kind of seeing the writing on the wall where he's it's probably time to move on from him after this season is at least as a starter is, is, is there. And I think that's okay. Uh, you know, thank you for your service. Really appreciate you. I hope you do really well and find another team that can fit you a little bit better that can deal with your, um, you know, your shooting struggles. Um, but that's kind of what I think is going on with him. Um, Cole Anthony, man, I, I think there's, I think there's a couple of things. One is he did have that thigh injury that I think was bothering him a lot more than we realized and wasn't being talked about nearly enough from the front off or from the, you know, from the coaching staff. I think it, I think it really was bothering him a lot longer than we realized. Cause there was times like you play eight minutes, you know, play one game, not another, like he was kind of in and out because of this injury. And then, you know, he started playing through it. And I think like, I think he's just been playing through it. Um, and then I also just think, you know what? If you look at the last four years of basketball with Cole Anthony, he's had really hot moments. I just played really well. And he's had really down moments. And I think we're also just kind of seeing, eh, maybe this is just who you are. You're just kind of a, a hot and cold player and you can go on really long stretches of being on a heater. And then you can go on really long stretches, unfortunately of where you're not being very effective. But I also think Cole was really effective at his best when Joe Ingles was next to him, healthy being that secondary ball handler. And then, you know, when he came, like, I think when you have both of them not healthy and not playing great right away, it just kind of like took that second unit a little bit of time to start figuring their shit out. And we saw the last couple of games, Mo Wagner started playing better. Cole Anthony started playing better. Even Joe Ingles started playing better those last, you know, two or three games, four games. And I'm just hoping that, this week of time that they have off will allow them all to kind of get right physically, come back, yeah. do a good practice day, get their shit back together and come back and get these next 27 games back to being one of the better second units in the, in the league instead of one of the worst second units in the league. That's kind of like my observation. What, a, what are kind of, some that makes a lot of sense, seen, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I think uh, I agree that Fultz, this is probably his last season in Orlando. And it sucks because there have been times when he's played really well. But yeah, if you just look at like, from a roster, yeah, and like from a from a roster construction standpoint, you can't have that many guys on the court that, you know, struggle with their shot. And and he has been a good facilitator and, and you know, set up other guys at times. But I think you need someone that can, you know, be like a 40 plus percent th- a three point shooter out there um just so that you know when guys like franz and powell have the ball in their hands you know you have a guy that can play off ball and catch and shoot and things like that i think that would be huge for them and then the fact that not only is he struggling from three and not shooting the ball from three but the fact that now it's impacting his free throw percentage and stuff too that's significant it seems like maybe he you know he's also taking very few free throws per game compared to where he's been in the past so that makes me think that he's trying to avoid contact because he doesn't want to shoot free throws because he knows he's struggling. So there's definitely issues there. Um, with Cole, I agree with you. I think 
Cole and, and, and uh, Joe Ingles, I think, uh, obviously on the court, they've made impact at times. But I think also behind the scenes, they're like really good leaders, huge vibe guys. Like, yeah. they're the guys that are uh, friends with everyone and cracking jokes. And like, I think they are important in the locker room. Uh, they've They've kind of become the veteran leaders of this team and uh keep everyone's energy kind of up too so i think their impact does go beyond the court um and you're right this might be who cole anthony is you know he might be like that microwave scorer that kind of comes in and gets hot at times and other times he'll have a shooting slump and, and you just hope that you know hopefully come playoff time he is the hot version of cole anthony and uh that's not yeah. wrong but um you know where he can get <laughs> he's a good looking dude and... we can say that too <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um so yeah i mean this team has tons of potential. And I think when you look at the young core, you have quite a few pieces that you're like, okay, this is a franchise cornerstone for us and someone to build around going forward. Like, I think obviously you have the big two with Paolo and Franz. I think Suggs has someone, it has become someone that you're going to build around going forward. And he's part of your team. Uh, I think Jonathan Isaac, the hope is that eventually he can get back to a point where he's playing 30 minutes a game, but you know, we'll see if his body will allow that or if there's, I think right now there's being cautious with them, which I understand. Yeah. Um, and then I think really they want to go into the playoffs and see how this team fares in the playoff series. And they can learn a lot from that. Not only do you get the guys playoff experience and confidence and all that from being on that stage, I think they can see what happens in a playoff series and, and figure out, okay, here's where we need to go. You know, we need to work on this. We need to improve the roster in this way. I think how they perform in the playoffs is going to be pretty telling. And I think even Jeff Weltman said after the break, like, our goal of the season is to make the playoffs and get our guys to play have experience. We're not going to go mortgage our future, you know, for this season. Like the goal is to, to take it one step at a time. And then once they make the playoffs and kind of see how they do in a playoff series, go from there, make some moves this off season. They're, they're positioned really well going forward, just with the young core they have, you know, the cap flexibility they have draft picks. They have like, it's, it's a really good spot to be in if you're a magic fan. Yeah, no, it, it's it's they didn't do anything that's gonna to, to mortgage them long term. They still have a ton of flexibility this off season, which is great, and we are gonna learn a ton. Like I'm I'm glad they didn't trade Wendell because they need to figure out how he's gonna play in the playoffs, and, and the playoffs are a different beast. And I don't think Magic fans really understand that, and that's why it's like it's really important to see how guys perform in those environments. Yeah. Now, as we wrap up this show, I do want to like just look at the playoff picture for a second, right? Um, and like let's just. Let's just do some fun, right? Let's be realistic. I don't expect the Magic to go from eighth to fourth seed. I just don't. I don't see us getting a home court advantage. But there is a world where you know the Miami Heat are kind of teetering back and forth. Uh, the the Pacers are a good team. Um, Philly, who knows what's up with them with Embiid being out? But it's a tight race. I could see the Magic jumping up to sixth or fifth potentially if things go really well for them. What's like? Your ideal matchup for the Magic for this for a first round potential upset. I'm thinking the Bucks. I kind of like how the Magic have matched up versus the Bucks. They're a team that you know will be in a better position in a in a few more weeks as they get more familiar and vibing with with Coach Doc and and all that stuff. But ultimately, I still find that team has having some holes on their roster and. I feel like we've just matched up well with the Bucks um, overall. So if if the Bucks stay in the third seed and the Magic can hold down the seventh seed, that is a a, a first round matchup that I actually think could happen. Um, I am like I'm more scared of Cleveland than I am of Milwaukee because Cleveland has just spanked the Magic's ass every single time they've played them this year. It's like not even been close almost any game. Um, so that's kind of why I lean a little bit more Milwaukee than I do there. I do think if New York could get into the third spot and where that it's again, the three, seven matchup, New York versus the magic. That's been a good matchup for us too. And with Randall being out granted, he'll be back. I think sooner than later, but I do think that is just another matchup that the magic have done well in, in the past. So yeah, I just had a total brain fart. I was thinking the five four good. matchup instead of the five six matchup, which was horrible. But okay. yeah, so looking at now that you know my brain's back working, I think Milwaukee has to be the one. You're right, Cleveland. Even though they they maybe like casual fans would look at Cleveland and think, okay, they're probably the team to play because you look at Milwaukee and like on paper you see Giannis and Dame. This team just does not look good right now. And I, I from the moment they hired Doc Rivers, I did not understand that. Like I, I don't know what they were thinking. This this is a guy that has struggled come playoff time, and 
I, I don't know. I, I think I get wanting to move on from Adrian Griffin, especially if Giannis or other people behind the scenes were pushing for that. I don't think Doc Rivers was the answer. I would have waited till the end of the season when there's more coaches that you could go, you know, go through a whole actual coaching process in the off season where you can interview a bunch of people and, you know, find the best candidate to just be like, Doc Rivers is available right now. We're going to go bring in Doc and give him this multi-year deal. I just don't have that much faith in Doc as a coach, um, especially like in today's NBA. You know, there may have been a time back in the day when Doc was better. I don't think he's the answer. And that team just does not look right right now. So, yeah, I think I would probably say Milwaukee's yeah. my pick too. I mean, and even if he is the answer next season, it, he hasn't had a – at any time to put in a training camp and, and build Bring the offense and in. defense. Yeah. It's, yeah. So it's, it's just like, there's too much kind of influx to in the middle and that's okay. I think because I would love for the magic to take advantage of that. Yeah. 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 That's probably the one that stands out yeah. to me. Um, yeah. Cause that, I think that could be an upset. I think that's how the magic get into the second round. So we'll yeah, see. I think it's fair. Yep. Yep. Well, Alex, I appreciate you turning on. We definitely have a fun 27 games remaining starting on the 22nd on Thursday when the Magic come back and they play, I believe they start their game. They start on a three-game road trip. Cleveland, Detroit, Atlanta, before they get back home on the 27th versus the Brooklyn Nets, who just fired Jacques Vaughn. Um, So I'm really looking forward to seeing how these last 27 games play out. Maybe the Magic can get, you know, 45, 46 wins, 47 wins, somewhere around there. That would be an amazing jump from how they ended last season. And, uh, you know, we're going to, we're probably going to, unless something wild happens, we're going to see this Magic team in the playoffs. And that's going to be awesome, regardless if it's a sweep or we sweep them. I'm going to love every minute of it. Um, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show, talking some Magic Basketball with me. Please let all the listeners know where they can find you and your latest work. Yeah, follow me on Twitter at AlexKennedyNBA. You can watch my show, Running Up the Score, there. You can see all my articles, uh, whether it's for ESPN or Legends Magazine. I tweet them all out there. So, yeah, follow me on Twitter, X, whatever, at AlexKennedyNBA. And Magic fans, thanks for tuning in. This is another episode of The Close-Up, a part of the Orlando Magic HQ Network, and we'll see you next week. Peace.